Hello, it's Dr. Peg here at Elisha's Home on Freedom Mountain, and we've had another week that has sped by, and uh, lots of rain in the last several days, but today is a beautiful, sunny, hot, a hot day, but it's a beautiful day, a beautiful day. So today, I'm excited as we're going to start a new series, and this series is entitled Under the Restraints of Limitations. And so in the past, we've talked about how sometimes when we look in the natural, we see, just as we talked about last week, uh, you know, we'll say, I can't believe my eyes, and actually we're looking in the natural rather than in the spirit. And so our new series, uh, is going to focus on how we live under the restraints of limitations. And oftentimes we don't even know it. Sometimes we just blindly walk through day to day and we really are not aware of the limitations that we live under. And so today our message is entitled Dare to soar. We're going to be uh, looking at a chapter in Acts, a message that Stephen gave, uh, and how he referred back to the life of Moses. And, uh, you know, oftentimes we think that we're very familiar with the passage in Exodus about Moses, but today our message is going to be very interesting as it brings to light some things that Stephen in the New Testament was saying to the believers in the Sanhedrin at the time that he was in ministry. So let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we fully commit this time, this specific time, uh, to your worship, to um, allowing ourselves to be teachable, to see things, to uh, hear things, to grasp things, to uh, prepare to apply things in our life that maybe we've never seen before. And so, Heavenly Father, we just uh, open our hearts and our minds to you. We ask that you would give us uh, vision, you would give us clarity to see things in our own lives that we've never seen before. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that you would give us uh, a word, a rhema word, as we walk through our lesson today, and that there would be time that we could spend with you uh, in the remainder of the week uh, for you to give us further clarity for application in our own life. And so, Heavenly Father, we give you all glory and all honor, and uh, we're look, looking forward to what you have for us. In your precious name we pray, amen. How many of you have ever gone to um, the circus? You've gone to the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus when you were little. Put your hand up. How many of you were just in awe as you watched the big elephants uh, stand in their poses and do the specific things that uh, the trainers requested of them. I can remember being little and um, just all the lights and the tent and the just that ambience of the environment and uh, was always in awe as a young person of how obedient the elephants were. But you know, as I got older, I began to think more and more about the hard work that must have gone in to the training of those elephants and the obedience and all of that. So I thought for today, we would just start out by pondering on that. What are some, some memories that you have from when you were a child, when you went to the circus? You know, were you fascinated by the elephants? Or maybe you were fascinated by the lions and the tigers, or maybe you were fascinated by the clowns. You know, what are what are some things that you really enjoyed about the circus? So I began to think, you know what? How do they get those elephants? 
to do what they did because that was my area that was really interesting to me and so I remember you know that as you were getting ready to go into the circus oftentimes the elephants would be standing and they would have like a, a rope around maybe their right foot right front foot that was tied to a stake and they just pleasantly would be standing there eating their hay or drinking some water and uh, they were huge of course when you're little and even you know as a grown-up they're still huge right and so I began to really really ponder that experience and ask God about that how these creatures were trained and they were so docile and so one of the questions I had for God was are elephants born with a docile personality and so that was just one of my little questions that I spun off as you know I'm, I'm ready to do some research on these elephants and so I found that uh, those elephants begin their life as a young calf and they have to be psychologically reformed to become the future stars that they're going to be and they have to learn to live within the restraints of physical limitations so a circus elephant like i said he begins when he's a young calf and he is abducted from the protection of his mother within the herd and so at the very very beginning of his training the trainers introduce what's called the training crush and this is the uh, intention to crush the young elephant's spirit and it may include physical caning it might be deprivation of sleep and food but all of these are components of what they call the training crush and they carry a bull hook as a visual reminder as they hobble the young elephants with ropes meaning they tie ropes around their feet pull their legs out and put them in the performing positions and those are all positions that we sit at the circus we applaud so after learning all of this I sat back and I wasn't so pleased that I was enthralled by the performance of the elephants because I realized what those elephants had to go through what their life entailed and so keep in mind that one of the first things that had to happen was that their spirit had to be broken and they had to have uh, imprints of limitation as that trainer as they learned to allow the trainer to dominate and so initially they would have a 10 foot iron stake that was driven into the ground and then they would tether the elephant to the thick or to that stake with a thick heavy metal chain and so after days of fighting for his freedom that calf he finally gives up he succumbs to the limitations because he's fully persuaded that he must live out his life in captivity and he never entertains the possibility of breaking free as an adult elephant the Borneo elephant I found out uh, could be a pygmy elephant meaning a smaller the smallest of the species of elephants by size can weigh up to 4,000 pounds now that's the smallest the largest the African bush elephants can weigh up to 13,000 pounds and from the shoulder they can stand at 12 feet tall so they are majestically impressive impressive 
13,000 pounds. So now I ask you, are these elephants capable of pulling up the stake and racing for freedom? You would think so, right? So you would say to yourself, okay, what's the limitation? There is no limitation. It's in their mind. It's in their mind. They have come to believe that as they were a young calf, that they are staked to that metal stake and that 13,000 pounds or 4,000 pounds, that they're not capable of breaking loose. So they live their entire life under the limitation of that metal post. They live their entire life. Now, let me ask you this. Can you relate to those elephants? You might be shaking your head like, lady, what are you talking about? Well, let me ask you this. Are there limitations that hold you captive in your present season that you think you don't have any power or any right to overcome. Charles Schwab once said, when a man has put a limit on what he will do, he has put a limit on what he can do. So in this series, we're gonna examine some of the limitations that are holding us back from becoming all that God has for us. We're gonna look forward to embracing our purpose and living fully in that purpose as we pull up the stake and run for freedom. So we know that, you know, when we're talking to young people, we should never tell them that something cannot be done. Why? You know, it might be something that you look at and say, well, I could never do that, or that's not my purpose, or that's not my thing, but we don't know that that's not why they were born and that that may be their specific destiny and their purpose. And so what might look impossible to us, and it may be, it may well be impossible without God, but maybe they have been equipped with the faith if they are totally reliant on him, maybe they will walk out and see him do the impossible in their life. So we need to be very careful as to if we have limitations that we have accepted for ourselves and we walk in, sometimes, like I said, those limitations are there and we don't even realize that they're there just as the elephants. They don't realize that, you know what? I weigh 13,000 pounds. I could pull that stake out and I could be free, right? So what's holding us back? Let's make sure that in our words that we're careful that whatever our limitations we have allowed to be put on us, maybe that we're not even aware of, that we don't pronounce those over our youngsters. Now, let's take a moment and talk about the Wright brothers. You know, on the news lately, there's been an awful lot of stories about travelers and air flight and some of the things that they're running into. And so the other day, I began to think about the Wright brothers and I began to think, you know what? What if the Wright brothers had not walked out uh, what their destination was? Uh, well, first of all, we wouldn't be listening to all of those stories on the news about travelers having flight issues, but think about it. What if, what if they had not taken the innate abilities that God gave them and stuck their necks out to be different and have people laugh at them and make fun of them? Because remember, they, uh, they owned a bicycle. They were bicycle mechanics, not aeronautical engineers. And so, you know, when you study out their history, they also had a, their first initial business. The one brother as a teenager uh, had a printing 
business. And so there you can see that he had a spirit of entrepreneurship. You can see that, you know, he knew how to work on a printing machine. Uh, he learned how to make the print bigger and various, as we would call it today, fonts. And so there were things that God had innately put into their package, their toolbox, and as humans looked at them, can you only imagine the things that were said to them as they were trying to take flight initially as people looked at them as bicycle mechanics rather than aeronautical engineers? So let me ask you this, what is it that God has asked you to do that you have refused to do because you have lived under a limitation? You've pronounced it over yourself, you've accepted it, you've walked under it, you're still stuck under it, you've become a prisoner of that limitation which has held you back from doing whatever it is that God has placed the innate abilities in you to do in your lifetime. Like I said earlier, we're going to focus on Moses. We all know that Moses began uh, in the time era where the Pharaoh uh, was calling out the Hebrew babies to be brought forth and mama and daddy made the little wicker basket, put the char in so that it wouldn't leak, wrap that precious baby up, put him out in the reeds, and then his sister Miriam ran along the edge. And as she ran along the edge, she saw the princess take in the baby and then stepped up to say that she knew a nursemaid that would feed her baby. And so today we're going to take a look at the life of Moses. We're going to look at uh, if he were born in modern society, we would say that uh, at the age of three months, there was an orphan spirit that would have put a limitation over him, uh, would have altered his identity as he lived, uh, as he lived as an Egyptian prince instead of a Hebrew. Uh, we're going to take a look at the fact that uh, according to a principle that was within him, he stepped out and murdered and how that impacted his life. And there was a limitation there that he sir came to. And we're going to look at some of the things that he might have said as he walked through the various seasons in his life. And so here are some of the things that he might have said. He might have said, hey God, I can do what you want me to do because, get ready, there's the because, and now there's a big old list. He might have said, I have a terrible, horrible past, I've sinned, I've murdered, I've lied, I've run and run and run, I betrayed my family's confidence. I've relinquished my spiritual talents. I'm full of hate and I suffer from stage fright. Those are just a few of the excuses that he would just shoot off. So how many excuses do we have that were birthed from limitations because something someone said because of a situation that we experienced that didn't turn out like we thought it should or how about maybe we tried something and it didn't go as we had wished and so then we told ourselves that we're just an utmost failure and laid it out this area this area this area and so what we've done is We've not only tied ourselves to one stake, but we may have tied ourselves to numerous stakes. So we may be more of a captive than the circus elephant. Now, when we look at the life of Moses, we see that he's got a, a lot of identity issues. And typically we would study 
the story of Moses in the book of Exodus. But today, we're going to take a look at Acts chapter 7. We're going to look, begin in verse 17, and we're going to study the story of Moses' life told by Stephen. All right, so he begins in verse 17 to 22 in telling us about the early life of Moses. It says, but when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king arose who did not know Joseph. This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not live. And at this time, Moses was born and was well pleasing to God. And he was brought up to his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. All right. So we know that Moses was wise and we also know that he had an eloquence when he spoke and also wise in his deeds. Now, that's not the impression as time goes on. That's not the impression that we get from Moses. That's not how Moses eventually sees himself. So notice at this time, Moses was born and he was well pleasing to God. And so from birth previous to his conception, there was a destination. There was a calling that was on Moses' life. And so notice that he was well pleasing to God without the temple or without the customs of the institutional religion. Right? Remember that. That's really important. And so notice he was mighty in words and deeds. He was wise. He was skillful with how he used his words. And he was a man that was seen of mighty deeds. Now, that was as an Egyptian man, right? With an orphan spirit, an identity issue. In verse 23 to 29, we see that Israel rejects Moses. Now, when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. And the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them saying, men, you are brethren, why do you wrong one another? But he did his neighbor wrong, pushed him away, saying, You made, who made, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Then, at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. So remember the fight or flight? He chose flight. And so he fled to the land of Midian, got married, and had two sons. So when he was 40 years old, that was when he came out to visit his brother, and this took place. He came down off of his royal throne out of the care and the concern for his brethren, right? And so we see that when Moses offered deliverance to Israel, he was rejected. He was rejected with spite. Israel denied that he had any right to be ruler and judge over them. Now, Stephen's message was plain. 
and he's talking to the people of his era and he's saying you've rejected Jesus who is like Moses yet greater than him and you deny that Jesus has any right to be a ruler and judge over you ouch ouch Verse 30 to 34, he teaches about when God appeared to Moses at Mount Sinai. And when 40 years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. And when Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. And as he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. Then the Lord said to him, Take your sandals off, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. And so an angel appeared to the Lord, or appeared of the Lord to Moses in the wilderness on the mountain. And so again, Stephen stresses the point that his reply to the council, the Sanhedrin, that God, his glory, and his work was not confined to the temple. God appeared to Moses in the wilderness before there was ever a temple. So let me just stop for a moment and say, where do you meet God? Do you think that you have to come to the tabernacle to meet God? Or do you meet God in your prayer closet? Or do you meet God out in the field when you're on the tractor? Do you meet God when you're at the grocery store? Where do you meet God? In your mind, do you have him limited to the church building, the tabernacle? What limitations have you put on God? and where and when you can meet with him. And so Stephen emphasizes that God both called Moses and commissioned Moses when he repeated, I will send you to Egypt. So it wasn't Moses' idea to go to Egypt. It was God. In verse 35 and 36, we see that Moses was Israel's deliverer despite Israel's previous rejection. This Moses whom they rejected saying, who made you a ruler and a judge is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. This Moses whom they rejected, God had appointed. God had appointed. Stephen reassured them that the unmistakable sign one of them was the burning bush in the wilderness. Notice he says he brought them out. Though Israel rejected Moses at what might be called his first coming, he still remained God's chosen deliverer for Israel. And so when we study out the scripture, we can see that Israel repeatedly rejected Moses. Looking now at verse 37 to 41. This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brother. Him you shall hear. This is he who is in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel 
who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey, but rejected. And in their hearts they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. So Moses promised that there would come after him another prophet. He warned Israel that they should take special care to listen to the coming prophet but just as they had rejected Moses they were rejecting Jesus who is the prophet Moses spoke of and so in the portion of scripture it says this is he who is in the congregation who received the living oracles Moses like Jesus led the congregation of God's people enjoyed special intimacy with God and brought forth the revelation of God. Now notice they made a calf in those days and they rejoiced in the works of their own hands. When Israel rejected Moses and God's work through him, they rejected God with their own man-made religion. Stephen applied the same idea to the Sanhedrin council that he was speaking to. So the phrase, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands, is a phrase that we need to take a look at. So one of the accusations against Stephen was that he blasphemed the temple. It wasn't that Stephen spoke against the temple but against the way Israel worshipped the, te the temple of God instead of the God of the temple. So did they worship God? Did they worship the temple? They worshiped the temple. So just as Israel worshiped the calf in the wilderness, so now they were worshiping the works of their own hands. And so in verse 42 and 43, we see God's response to the repeated rejection of his messengers. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Molech and the star of your god, Remphan, images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. So God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven in their rejection of Moses and the God who sent him. Israel turns instead to corrupt idols bringing judgment upon themselves as you could read and study more about in Amos chapter 5 verse 25 and 27. So Stephen as he's bringing his message he takes the passage from Amos and he changes it ever so slightly to bring to the point of the listeners he says beyond Damascus. Now that's in verse 27, Amos chapter 5. But Stephen changed it to beyond Babylon. So he's using the Old Testament to speak to the New Testament covenant believers who are refusing, right? So Stephen, he quotes the text he alters it just a smidge to make it prevalent to the day of the people he's speaking to. And so we see that because he's not speaking to the people of the northern kingdom, but rather the leaders of Israel in the south, he's 
speaking to their specific history, right? So it has a lot more prevalence when it's your very own history. Everybody has a story, right? So your own history makes a lot more sense. So when we talk about limitations, we're not talking about the person sitting next to you. We're talking about the limitations, your limitations, your story. What do you have? Everybody has limitations. Don't sit there and shake your head and say, no, I don't have any. Don't do that. Don't do that. When you do that, you're missing out because God wants to show you. Maybe there's something that he's been asking you to do and you just shook your head, gave him 30 odd million excuses like Moses did. But you know what? It's not about you. It's about him. It's about the fact that you serve the impossible God. It's not about you. It's about him. It's about him and you allowing him to do whatever he needs to do and to use you to do whatever that is. All right, so let's take a look now at verse 44 to verse 50. And so we see in this portion of scripture that even as Israel rejected God, they still had the tabernacle and then later they had the temple. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he appointed instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house would you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? So Stephen, he's confronting their idolatry of the temple and in so doing he's trying uh, to get them to see that you know we don't want to be worshiping the building we want to be worshiping the one true God and so let's look at verse 51 to 53 and so he says you stiff-necked in uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Yikes. Let's read it again. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Notice there's an exclamation point. So he's not just gently saying this. He's blasting this. You always, that's a strong word, always Resist who? The Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. So are we speaking about tradition? We're speaking about tradition. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. Can you imagine that as he is calling them stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, and then he continues on and says, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So it's not even a just a generational thing. It's a thing that goes back right and so he's not he's not being mild mantered, mannered about this and so can you imagine the Sanhedrin as they're sitting there listening you can only imagine the whispering that's going on as the anger 
stirs up within them as they want to what they want to go after him this is what Spurgeon said about this portion of scripture he says he takes the sharp knife of the word and rips up the sins of the people laying open the inward parts of their hearts and the secrets of their soul he could not have delivered that searching address with greater fearlessness had he been assured that they would thank him for the operation the fact that his death was certain had no other effect upon him than to make him yet more zealous that speaks volumes about stephen and his walk with the lord right yikes yikes you can only imagine the offense the offense that would be there in verse 54 we see the council's reaction to the sermon that stephen was giving when they heard these things they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth they were angry because he had hit the target they couldn't dismiss it they couldn't ignore it and so instead they reacted in rage rather than submission to the holy spirit notice the phrase they gnashed at him with their teeth this can't but help to remind us of the images or the imagery of hell seven different times in the scripture jesus described hell as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth specifically you could look at matthew chapter 8 verse 12 to begin that little journey of study remember the sanhedrin these were men that were prominent men that were successful and they appeared to be religious yet they were rejecting god and associating themselves with hell rather than heaven in verse 55 and 56 we see stephen's vision of jesus they had to be loving this but he being full of the holy spirit gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said look I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God so the little portion of Scripture but he being full of the Holy Spirit this was in great contrast to the behavior of the council the fact that Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit shows his courage his wisdom and his power in preaching now notice in his vision he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God it is significant to note that Jesus is standing here in this scripture as opposed to the more common description of him sitting in heaven Matthew 26 verse 64 Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 those are two that you want to take a look at notice that he's always at the right hand of God the Father but this specific vision showed him standing so we could ask ourselves I wonder why he was standing why was it significant in that vision for it to be mentioned that he's not only at the right hand but he's not sitting he's standing we could ask ourselves was it that he was showing solidarity with Stephen at the moment of crisis remember that he reacts passionately to the problems of his people 
right? Could it be that he was standing to plead Stephen's case before God the Father, assuring that though he was found guilty and punished on earth, he was found righteous and rewarded in heaven? In verse 57 and 58, we see the execution of Stephen by stoning. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, ran at him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Notice that they cried out with a loud voice, and it was after he had declared that he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. It was too much, too much for their evil beings to absorb. And so they reacted quickly, violently, together in one accord. And so when Jesus was before the same body of men declared that he would sit at the right hand of God. They had the same reaction and sealed his death as a blasphemer. And you can read about that in Matthew chapter 26, verse 64 to 66. They cried out, they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. So their reaction seems extreme, but it's typical of those who reject God and are lost in their spiritual insanity. They wailed in agony they covered their ears at the revelation of God, which they regarded as blasphemy. Now, it's a dangerous thing to be religious apart from having a real relationship with Jesus Christ. This fulfills what Jesus warned about in John chapter 16, verse 2 and 3, when he said, Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service, and these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. In the scripture where it says ran at him, it actually uses the ancient Greek word hormeo. This is the same word that's used to describe the mad rush of the herd of swine into the sea in the book of Mark chapter 5 verse 13. This was an out of control mob rushing at Stephen. The Greek word hormeo, hormeo, it means to run out of control. Interesting, same word used as the herd of swine right into the sea. Now, you might be asking, you know, like when someone gets stoned in that time, what what's a historical This is what's written in the Mishnah. It describes the practice of stoning. This just gives us some history. It gives us some history so we can relate to the circumstances of what actually happened to Stephen. When the trial is finished, the man convicted is brought out to be stoned. With 10 cubits from the place of stoning, they say to him, confess, for it is the custom of all about to be put to death to make confession. And everyone who confesses has a share in the age to come. 
four cubits from the place of stoning, the criminal is stripped. The drop from the place of stoning was twice the height of a man. One of the witnesses pushes the criminal from behind so that he falls face downward. He's then turned over on his back. If he dies from the fall, that is sufficient. If not, the second witness takes the stone and drops it on his heart. If this causes death, that is sufficient. If not, he is stoned by all the congregation of Israel. Let's take a look now at verse 59 and 60, and we see Stephen's last words. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And so Stephen's life ended in the same way that it had been lived in complete trust in God. And so we see that God actually answered Stephen's last prayer and used it to touch the heart of a man who energetically agreed with his stoning, even though the man didn't know the prayer was being answered. When we get to heaven, we should thank Stephen for every blessing brought through the ministry of Saul of Tarsus. God heard Stephen's last prayer prayer, his last request. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, is the evidence of it. Cried out with the Lord a, a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. He displayed the same forgiving attitude that Jesus had had on the cross in Luke chapter 23, verse 34. And then the text simply describes his passing as tenderly as possible by simply saying, and he fell asleep. So we know that Stephen was a man who was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he was greatly used he was greatly used. He didn't allow the limitations, the fact that the Sanhedrin, he knew that they were planning his stoning. He knew that. He knew that this would be the last sermon he would give. He was at the end of the race and he sprinted to the finish line. And his very last request continued on blessing the people, bringing them as the Apostle Paul came into his calling. Little poem, Spirella wrote, there's no thrill in easy sailing when skies are clear and blue. There is no joy in merely doing things which any man can do. But there is some satisfaction that is mighty sweet to take when you reach a destination that you thought you would never make. So I ask you today, what destination has God asked you to take that you initially thought was impossible? What destination is he asking you to take in this current season. Remember, we have to ignore those who say, oh, that is impossible because we serve the God of the impossible. We need to bloom where God has placed us. We need to produce fruit for the kingdom. We need to break loose 
of those limitations that have been spoken over us. We need to live our life in the fullness of faith. We need to spread our wings as an eagle and soar above the limitations believed by faithless men. Dare to expect God to do the impossible in your life. With him, in him, through him, all things are possible if only you would believe. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we've had to gather around your word. We ask, Heavenly Father, that as we go back and refer to the scriptures that were brought forth today, that you would continue to send us out into the deep so that the mysteries would be uh, revealed. And Heavenly Father, we ask that we would walk in obedience as we continue on in this week. We thank you for the blessings that we have encountered. We thank you for the healings that we've seen, for the miracles that we've seen, those that are in progress. We continue to lift up those on our, uh, our prayer journal that are uh, asking for a touch from the great physician. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for those blessings that are yet to come. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, meeting all of our needs. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the time that we can spend with you one-on-one. -on -one. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the revelation, the rhema word that you will continue to give us as we walk out this week in uh, search of any limitations that may have been put on our lives. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would release those limitations by the blood of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful week. Be blessed. I'll see you yet again next week. Take care. God bless.